Good evening. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Sean Otto. On Sunday night, our scheduled presenter, Nobel Literature Laureate Derek Walcott, had to cancel his appearance due to ill health. When Sean Otto generously agreed to make changes to his schedule to step in and speak in Dr. Walcott's place, we were absolutely thrilled. In the spirit of Professor Walcott's planned lecture, Mr. Otto's remarks will be an ideal complement to the science presentations you have attended throughout the day. Tonight marks a special moment of reflection in our conference experience. This morning, we heard from engineer economist Rajendra Pachari. This afternoon, we heard from marine ecologist Nancy Rabelais and water chemist, environmental scientist David Sedlak. Tomorrow, we will hear from environmental scientist Peter Glick, environmental ethicist Larry Rasmussen, civil engineer Asit Biswas, and geographer William Graff. At roughly the halfway mark tonight, your head is probably full of new information, most of it pretty disturbing, and you know that tomorrow you will get additional sobering news about the emerging global water crisis. What do these critical issues of water scarcity, water pollution, water economics, water ethics, have to do with our lives as individuals, as consumers, and importantly for tonight's lecture, as participants in a democratic society. Informed citizenship is one of our core goals with the Nobel Conference. Whether it's energy, aging, human health, or the cosmos, there are always policy implications of the topics we explore. Like Walcott, Sean Otto is literally, literally light, literary light, sorry, a screenwriter and producer whose credits include the Academy Award nominated film House of Sand and Fog. But we asked him to speak this evening about one of his other lives as the co founder and CEO of Science Debate 2008, which has been called the largest political initiative in the history of American science. Science Debate is a nonpartisan citizens' initiative co sponsored by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine, and endorsed by nearly 200 colleges and universities and dozens of Nobel laureates. The purpose of Science Debate is to encourage national discussion of critical issues, critical science issues and civic engagement in science policy. To that end, it posed 14 major science questions to candidates Barack Obama and John McCain in an historic online debate that made more, made more, eight, more than 800 million media impressions. Sorry. Two of those 14 questions related directly to this year's Nobel Conference topic. Mr. Otto speaks around the country on science policy and retooling America for the century of science. He has written for or appeared in numerous science trade, online, and mass media outlets nationally and internationally. He lives with his wife, Minnesota State Auditor Rebecca Otto, and their son in a wind-powered, passive solar, geothermal home they designed and built with their own hands. Please join me in welcoming Sean Otto. Thank you. Can everybody hear me all right? Good, yes, okay. Well, thank you, Chuck, and I'd, I'd also like to thank Gwen Freed and the organizing committee and Gustavus Adolphus College for having me here tonight. And I'd also just like to take a brief moment and send all of our well wishes out to Derek Walcott. I know that we all wish him a speedy recovery and I will try and stumble along in his shoes 
I'm glad that uh, I was asked to speak about my other life, uh, so I wouldn't invite any negative comparisons. Uh, democracy in the age of science is something that uh, is a passionate topic for me. Uh, whenever the people are well informed, Thomas Jefferson wrote, they can be trusted with their own government. But today, we're living in a new century, the century of science, I call it. We're really looking at a transformation that is perhaps on par with the beginning days of the Enlightenment. We're seeing a rapid increase in the number of scientists and engineers around the world and a consilience, uh, to quote E.O. Wilson, of once separate fields. This is causing a lot of new mind-bending policy questions that we're going to have to be dealing with over the course of the next century. Science policy is how science affects our day-to-day -day lives, and that's where government and policy making and politics all come into the equation. One of those issues, of course, is stem cells and the implications that that has brought up for several about uh, where does life begin and how do we alter it biosciences, but there are a whole host of others, including genetics and all the implications with genetic engineering, privacy, healthcare, designer children. What about synthetic life? How will that affect the environment? Uh, we're really on the verge of being able to create life. Uh, Craig Venter is talking about it right now. Nanotechnology and geoengineering. If we geoengineer solutions to climate change, how is that going to affect other countries uh, and uh, their economies? Uh, neuroscience has lots of implications, especially through reverse engineering the brain and the emergence of super intelligences, uh, what some scientists and researchers are calling the singularity, the point where artificially created intelligence becomes more uh, intelligent than humans. How do we deal with all of these questions? But that's just really the beginning. Uh, this consilience uh, that I'm talking about, all these merging of different fields of science, uh, is really what's happening a lot. All of the great, exciting research is going on in the fringe of these various fields where they overlap. And our speakers here at this conference are a great example of this. We have an engineer-economist, a marine ecologist, a water chemist-environmental scientist, a Christian environmental ethicist, geographer and a river scientist, a water chemist and engineer, engineer environmental science. You see all these fields are emerging. In my case, I'm kind of an odd fit, but I am there at the bottom after all. Um, now, we also, in addition to these unusual uh, questions that are just emerging from science and policy, we're being dogged by a lot of unresolved science policy problems that are being pushed to the head by population and global development. Chief among those that we've been talking about today, of course, is climate change. Uh, tied in with climate change is energy. Healthcare is next on the list. And of course, water resources, particularly as they're affected by climate change, but also by global development. Uh, but there are a whole host of other major, major science policy challenges that in many ways are the largest challenges that are facing our government over the next several decades. Are we well equipped to deal with these challenges? <laughs> it's a problem, especially when you drill that number down, because that includes some uh, veterinarian, uh, several MDs, uh, but really only 1% have any background in the hard sciences. Uh, in 1995, Congress closed the OTA, that's the Office of Technology Assessment, which was Congress's primary nonpartisan science policy advisory body. So these days, members of Congress often rely on the internet or lobbyists for science information of dubious quality while they're making key policy decisions. This is a problem. So the question really is, is America, to quote Jefferson again, well enough informed for the century that we're living in, the century of science. Uh, you know, this is somewhat of a famous video, uh, <clears throat> and it perhaps answers the question in the negative. This is uh, a very brief uh, cut from this. It was called A Private Universe, and a couple of enterprising filmmakers went around and taped Harvard students and professors on commencement day 
1987, asking them a simple question. Why is it warmer in the summer than in the winter? Okay, I think the seasons happen because as the Earth travels around the sun, it gets nearer to the sun, um, which produces warmer weather and gets farther away, which produces colder weather, and, then, and hence the seasons. How hot it is or how cold it is at any given time of the year has to do with the, the, the closeness of the Earth to the sun during the seasonal periods. The Earth goes around the sun. <laughs> And, and it gets hotter when we get closer to the sun, and it gets colder when we get further away from the sun. These graduates, like many of us, think of the Earth's orbit as a highly exaggerated ellipse. Even though the Earth's orbit is very nearly circular, with distance producing virtually no effect on the seasons, we carry with us the strong, incorrect belief that changing distance is responsible for the seasons. I took uh, physics, and planetary motion, and relativity, and electromagnetism and waves. I've never really had a scientific background whatsoever, and I, and I got through school without having it. I've gotten... And that's kind of the problem, isn't it? She probably has gone on to serve uh, in Congress quite successfully. <clears throat> in a 2001 National Science Foundation survey on science literacy in America, they found that 53% of American adults were unaware that the last dinosaur died before the first human arose. Probably because they'd seen them together on the Flintstones. 50% <clears throat> of adults knew that the Earth orbits the sun and takes a year to do it, so that's, you know, it, it, it's, it's half. 53% uh, of adults knew that human beings as we know them today developed from earlier species of animals. However, in 2007, things changed. 60% of U.S. adults surveyed stated their belief that God created humans in their present form less than 10,000 years ago. Significant change from 2001. <clears throat> what could have made that change happen? Well, in politics, that's considered the sweet spot. Those are the swing voters who go with the prevailing political trend. And we're going to be talking about them a little bit uh, as we go forward here. Let's see, I've got to clear that. The problem is, is that this is hurting our competitiveness. Uh, in 2006, a fellow named Norm Augustine, the former CEO of Lockheed Martin, chief authored a report for the National Academies uh, called Rising Above the Gathering Storm that assessed American economic competitiveness. And one of the figures that it came up with after considerable research was that half of our economic growth since World War II comes from science and technology. But in 2005, a business roundtable report projected that by 2010, next year, 90% of all scientists and engineers will live in Asia. Now the BRT uh, maybe has an ax to grind here in releasing this report, but if it's even close to the truth, it represents a major shift in the economic underpinnings of the United States. That's a shift that we have to deal with and that in some ways we're dealing with right now. Uh, in November 2007, the, the race for president was heating up. And uh, another screenwriter, Matthew Chapman and I, both of us are known somewhat as science writers, we're talking and uh, Matthew happens to be Charles Darwin's great-great-grandson and he said, you know, none of them are talking about any of these things like healthcare, climate change, energy, biodiversity loss, ocean health, ocean acidification. Uh, nobody is mentioning a single one of these, but they seem to me to be the largest issues facing, facing the country and the world. And he said, you know, we ought to have a debate on this, a presidential science debate, and I stupidly said, that's a great idea. <clears throat> it was in the middle of the Hollywood writer's strike and we didn't have anything else to do. We thought it would take a couple months to whip together. Uh, the other individuals involved were science uh, journalist Chris Mooney, uh, philosopher Austin Dacey, marine biologist Cheryl Kirschenbaum, and uh, astronomer Lawrence Krauss. And we put up a website called sciencedebate2008.com and we put up a call for a presidential debate on science and technology. The response that we got from the scientific community was just overwhelming. Uh, we reached out through our net roots, through The Intersection, for instance, which is a blog that Chris and Cheryl run, and several other science blogs which have tens of thousands of people who follow them on a daily level, picked up the call and echoed it throughout the internet. We also placed 
uh, prominent pieces in various national news outlets just to get it rolling. And within weeks, we had 38,000 scientists and engineers sign on. There was obviously a huge untapped concern here. The AAAS, the National Academies, and the Council on Competitiveness agreed to co-sponsor the initiative, although they didn't agree to give us any money. The, uh, we had 30 Nobel laureates sign on. We had bipartisan congressional co-chairs, Vern Ellers, a Republican from uh, uh, Michigan, and Rush Holt, a Democrat from New Jersey, uh, as well as Craig Barrett, the chairman of Intel, the leaders of Texas Instruments, John Abell, the founder of Sci Boston Scientific, uh, and several other industry titans, and the presidents of over 100 U.S. universities, as well as nearly every major American science organization, ultimately representing a huge swath of the American public. We got PBS's program now and NOVA to sign on as our broadcast partners. David Brancaccio is going to moderate, and we agreed to do it at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia shortly before the Philadelphia primary. So by any measure, this many people in the American science community coming together and publicly calling for a presidential debate on science was news, or it should have been. The national news media, however, completely ignored the story. Uh, and perhaps this is why. I just want to take us back to the uh, Jib Jab did a little uh, cute little couple minute video here that really describes accurately the the climate of the for-profit news media in 2007. There was a time not long ago when each and every day at 6 o'clock each evening Union News was on its way from anchors of integrity and free channels to choose. That's what we were dealing with. Now, how are we going to break through that? Well, we thought maybe some of it had to do with the difference between journalistic and scientific thinking. You know, in journalism, there's always two sides to every story, right? It doesn't matter how many people on either side. For instance, Bob says 2 plus 2 equals 4. Julie says 2 plus 2 equals 6. The controversy rages. Science says most times one side simply wrong. Then, of course, there's politics. <clears throat> These are the three elements that we were trying to juggle and get to work together in a science debate. We began to realize that we were kind of in over our heads. Uh, but we were also butting up against something that was kind of serious, and that was the science news crisis. Uh, in 2005, for instance, the Shorenstein Center uh, did a report that tracked the number of science sections in weekly newspapers as they shrank from 95 
to 34. I'm sorry, uh, not weekly, daily newspapers. Uh, by, in 2005, by 2005, also only 7% of all the members of the National Association of Science Writers actually had full-time positions at major outlets. In May of 2008, as we were really trying to get these candidates to uh, do a debate in April, actually, late April in Philly, the Washington Post was killing its science section. By November of 2008, NBC followed suit, firing the Weather Channel's entire environmental unit and axing the four Earth environmental program during the middle of the Green Week. This is kind of a problem, especially considering the profile of climate change as a policy issue in America. <clears throat> By December, CNN fired its entire science, technology, and environmental news staff. We are clearly bucking a trend here. In March of this year, Boston Globe, which is located arguably in the capital of science and technology, particularly in the biosciences right now in America, uh, killed its world-renowned science section. Uh, this attrition is happening at an accelerating pace, and it is quite frightening. The media executives have made a conclusion that people are not interested in science. A conclusion that, as it turns out, is dead wrong, as I'll show you in a few moments. <clears throat> uh, one thing about this that I do like, however, is the science story that it's got up here. Uh, <clears throat> in the meantime, NPR said to Ira Flato uh, just uh, late last year, find half of your budget for his program, Science Friday on Talk of the Nation, Science Friday. Uh, that is one of the highest rated uh, programs on radio and one of the most downloaded podcasts that there are, and yet they're unable to fund the full show anymore. Uh, in 2008, the Pew uh, Forum did, uh, came out with figures that if you watch five hours of cable news, you expect to see one minute devoted to science and technology. Discovery, of course, covers science along with the paranormal. There's nothing today like Cosmos, which reached an estimated 600 million people, that Carl Sagan show, in 60 different countries. Uh, but we are seeing some effort on the part of the networks to cover science in depth. For instance, here's Brian Williams claiming to be covering it in depth. This is a uh, report on when, you know, remember last year when the population turned over we to 300 million. We are back this Monday million. night with NBC News In-Depth, an American milestone. It will take place across this country tomorrow morning, and if you didn't know it was coming, there's no way you would know. It wasn't all that long ago, November 20th of 1967, President Lyndon Johnson was giving a speech at the Commerce Department in Washington. The crowd started to applaud, noticing what was going on behind him. The president turned around just as the huge digital population counter above him, state of the art at the time, cranked the estimated U.S. population to 200 million. A lot of Americans thought we had grown just about as big as we ought to get. But of course, we didn't stop there. Well, tomorrow morning at 7.46 a.m. Eastern Time, and don't ask us how they estimate it, the U.S. population will click over to 300 million. Don't ask us how they know it, but scientists will estimate that the population will turn over to 300 million <clears throat> tomorrow. And that kind of pandering uh, is part of the problem. What do you mean, don't ask us how they know it? Isn't that your job to tell us? CBS, I don't know if we can get this one to play either. Uh, but Katie Couric, uh, who's getting a kind of a lot of things right these days, uh, did a, a much better job. Every 11 seconds, America moves one person closer. And number 300 million could come by birth, by oath, that I will support and defend. as a legal immigrant, or by stealth, someone sneaking into history. Any way of telling who number 300 million is going to be? No, there really isn't, because we don't count every single birth in the United States, and we don't count each person as they cross the border either direction. What she covered uh, was exactly how we do know, uh, that it may come from immigrants, it may come from birth, it may come from someone dying, uh, it may come from uh, all kinds of different factors, and we have no way of knowing for sure, uh, but our population estimates indicate that this is what's going to happen. It was a much better story. Uh, the science policy gap is really what we're fighting, though. Uh, of those science sections that are left, of those media outlets that are covering science at all, we found 
and this was something that we were surprised when we uncovered it, that editors forbid political reporters from covering science, even though most of the major challenges that we're facing revolve around it. Science reporters have no access to the political pages. Therefore, virtually no one in America is really covering these critical issues at a time when they're dictating a lot of the most important challenges that this nation is facing. That's a crime in our journalism and that's a major problem in our policy. <clears throat> now, this hasn't uh, been an issue for the business and economics beat. They long since crossed over onto the political page. The religion and ethics beat, as we all know, has long since crossed over onto the political page. The foreign affairs and the national security beat has crossed over to the political page. And in fact, candidates don't feel any compunction about opining on any of these things. Only science really remains ghettoized. The candidate's answer to us about that debate in Philly on April 18th, no, we can't. <clears throat> in fact, uh, a lot of others noted this problem with journalism and politics as well. For instance, the League of Conservation Voters uh, analyzed the five top network anchors' questions, there they are, of all the candidates up to that point. They'd conducted 171 interviews and asked them 2,975 questions. Any guess on how many were about climate change? Six. Six questions were about climate change or global warming, arguably the greatest policy challenge facing the country. Three of them mentioned UFOs, to put that in perspective. So that's the attitude our national news media has about science. So let's trace all of this back. What is going on here in America? Uh, well, really, going back to the Ritz, there are really two strains of thought. America was settled by the Puritans seeking religious freedom, but it was founded as a nation by men coming out of the Enlightenment seeking freedom of inquiry and freedom of thought. We've always had this mixed relationship, this intertwined DNA of science and religion traveling through our politics. In some ways, it's all Benjamin Franklin's fault. Without him, it wouldn't be an issue. Uh, the Declaration of Independence was fine as it was, uh, at least according to several of the prospective signers, but Thomas Jefferson sent it around for comments and Ben Franklin uh, made one comment. He suggested changing the words, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable, to we hold these truths to be self-evident. And with that was kind of born the concept of the separation of church and state that has been with us sense. <clears throat> that tension uh, has also come out in what a famous British novelist and science advisor called the two cultures, the gap between the sciences and the humanities. Uh, but remember England, uh, where we fled uh, for religious freedom? They've gotten over it. They've got Charles Darwin on the back of the 10-pound note. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we've got an eye on top of a pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. <clears throat> Moving forward, we really, had, we really entered the first golden age of science early on in, uh, in the 20th century. Einstein really opened the way, capturing a lot of the public's imagination. Uh, but then came a new kid on the block named Edwin Hubble. Edwin Hubble is really the first great popularizer of science, especially in America. He really was the most famous man in the world early in the 1930s. I know this because I researched a movie on him and I went through all his papers uh, and associated work at the Huntington Library. He was a Republican like most of the scientists of his time, but he saw no conflict between science and religion. And that's one of the themes of my talk, is that there really shouldn't be a conflict between science and religion. In fact, Hubble saw science as discovering the face of God or discovering God's natural order. He got the Pope to officially accept the Big Bang Theory even. For those of you who don't know it, Hubble was the foundation scientist of the field of cosmology. He discovered that there were other galaxies besides the Milky Way, vastly expanding our idea of the size of the universe. And in fact, that there was something called the redshift, and that implied the Big Bang. It's an oversimplification, but that's it in a nutshell. Uh, in fact, back then, newspapers around the country kept calling out screaming banner headlines about science topics, uh, particularly the exploits of Hubble. Uh, that kind of makes the scientists in the audience, I know, drool a little bit. <clears throat> My, those were the days. Uh, of course, we use science to win World War II uh, with not only 
the nuclear bomb, but also radar. In fact, that was something that C.P. Snow was a proponent of. His opponents were suggesting dropping bombs uh, or floating bombs with balloons and trying to get them in front of planes. <coughs> radar proved to be much more effective. Then the second golden age of science dawned in 1957 with the Soviet launch of Sputnik. Uh, science, however, turned inward as a result of this, and I'll tell you how that happened. Sputnik really held the high ground, right? In war, you want to be in the high ground, and that unnerved a lot of Americans to have Sputnik flying overhead. It motivated massive investments, but the, the funding for science shifted subtly from funding uh, based on wonder that was largely funded by great philanthropists like Andrew Carnegie to funding from the government based on fear. These investments spurred incredible economic growth and in fact uh, John F. Kennedy ran on, on this in no small part in his election campaign and the Apollo program captured the imagination of pop culture that was trending anti-science. The hippies were more about nature at the time uh, until the Apollo program came along. Scientists, however, because of all this money being thrown at them and the adoration and the pop cultural fame became complacent. They began to view public outreach as beneath them. For instance, they shunned Carl Sagan in a famous story. Uh, many of you may know that Carl Sagan was up for election to the National Academy of Sciences and his fellow uh, scientists did not vote him for election. One of the greatest science popularizers of all time. It was a shame. Scientists turned inward and be began to become disengaged from politics. And that has led to some of the problems that we're seeing today. Of course, things changed. Things always do change. What we relied on in the Cold War to be an opponent to help us fund science disappeared when we lost our national competitor in the fall of the Soviet Union. Investments in science and research began to fall off sharply. Other nations, meanwhile, have been ramping up. You can see the trend lines here if you look at China, Korea, Japan. Particularly, Asian countries are really making heavy investments towards that magic mark of 3%. The U.S. has tended to remain flat. Well, we asked the campaign advisors after they rejected us in Philadelphia, why not? What is it about debating science, really? We want to suss this out and see if we can overcome your objections. Several of them informally got back to us with three answers. The first was that science was perceived as a niche topic. It was risky to talk about with a very limited audience, was their idea. And remember, these are people that are likely from the other side of the two cultures debate, and they never took a science class in college anyway, so of course they'd view it as a niche topic. We decided to challenge that. They also told us that the religious right was a major force in politics, and they needed to focus on addressing those issues that the religious right was bringing up. And finally, there was the homecoming king contest, or the risk of embarrassment, uh, that uh, national politics is essentially like high school politics, and it, the person that gets elected is not the nerd from science class or econ class, it's the guy you want to have a beer with. Uh, some high school students were asked to show what cool people versus nerds looked like, and this is what they came up with. <coughs> Fortunately for Obama, there was a third high school demographic that no one had yet thought of. <laughs> now, we decided to knock these reasons down one by one. Is science really a niche topic? We commissioned a national poll through Harris Interactive, and we found that, in fact, it is not. Between those who somewhat and strongly disagree, fully 85% of the American public wanted the presidential candidates to debate things like climate change, energy, and health care. And this held identically true, interestingly enough, across both Republicans and Democrats. We turn from that to the objection that the religious right is a major force in politics. And some of this is perhaps uh, uh, true. Uh, and a lot of it, unfortunately, is geared around fear of science, which is because of this false dichotomy that's been built up by political operatives around science and religion. This is, uh, I stole this from Lawrence Krauss, uh, but this is out of a, uh, 
a uh, magazine and it's extolling the uh, virtues of fighting, of course, you can see you know, evolution and all the things that it's associated with, abortion, racism, pornography, homosexuality, divorce, euthanasia, of course those are the things that we associate naturally with, with evolution and science, right? <laughs> Um, you'll also notice that, uh, that this pirate scientist over here is intelligently aiming at the foundation, and this is the point. <clears throat> While the, uh, the priests are, are silly in shooting down the little balloons, and this was to motivate people to say, look, we've got to attack the foundation of evolution. That's the source of the problem. <clears throat> Some of this began with the Reagan FCC's abandonment of the Fairness Doctrine uh, and the rise of AM talk radio as a result. The Fairness Doctrine required that if you air controversial subjects on radio or TV, you are required to present opposing points of view. Uh, and that is not to say that the there's anything wrong with a religious right. They've been uh, an important voice in our politics since the very foundation of the country and they have a very valid point of view. But our democracy requires a plurality of voices, and with science sitting on the sidelines, it's been quiet on one side of that debate. Candidates, as a result, twice refused to debate science policy issues with us, but instead they twice attended nationally televised faith forums, where, ironically, they often talked about science. <clears throat> There's a Wired uh, article about, uh, about that. Uh, let's see if we can get this one to play. This is uh, Obama talking about science at the uh, Compassion Forum. Sen Senator, um, if one of your daughters asked you, and maybe they already have, Daddy, did God really create the world in six days? Mm -hmm. What would you say? Yeah, I'm trying to remember if we had this conversation. Um, <laughs> You know, what, I, what I've said to them is that uh, I believe that uh, God created the universe and that uh, the six days in the Bible may not be six days as we understand it. It may not be 24-hour days. Uh, and that's what I believe. You know, I know there's always a debate between uh, those who read the Bible literally and those who who don't, uh, and you know, that I think is a legitimate debate within uh, the Christian community, uh, of which I'm a part. Uh, you know, my belief is, is that uh, the story that the Bible tells about God creating this magnificent earth uh, on which we live, uh, that that is, that is essentially true. That is fundamentally true. Now, whether it happened exactly as, uh, uh, as we might understand it, reading the text of the Bible. Uh, that, you know, I, uh, I don't presume to know. Let's go to... But, um, uh, let, let me just make one, one last point yes. uh, on this. Uh, I do believe in evolution. Uh, I, do, I don't think that is incompatible with Christian faith. Just as I don't think science generally is incompatible with Christian faith. And I think that this is something that... Um, you know, we, we get bogged down in. Um, uh, there are those who suggest that uh, if you have a scientific bent of mind, then somehow you should uh, reject religion. And I, I, I fundamentally disagree with that. In fact, the more uh, I learn about the world, the more I know about science, the more I'm amazed about the mystery of of, uh, of this planet and, and this universe, and, and it strengthens my faith as opposed to, as opposed to weakens it. Um, <clears throat> the scientific method and the creationist method is portrayed in this uh, kind of famous Trevor cartoon. You'll see on the left the, the scientific method. Here are the facts. What conclusions can we draw from them? The creationist method is here's the conclusion. What facts can we find to support it? Now, this is echoed throughout our politics. You'll see, for instance, this quote from the first President Bush uh, in 1990 as he addressed the National Academies. Science, like any field of endeavor, relies on freedom of inquiry, and one of the hallmarks of that freedom is objectivity. No more than ever 
or now more than ever, excuse me, on issues ranging from climate change in 1990 to AIDS research, to genetic engineering, to food additives, government relies on the impartial perspective of science for guidance. Compare that to a quote by his son's spokesman. This administration looks at the facts and reviews the best available science based on what's right for the American people. <laughs> so we can tell that the conclusion has already been made, right? And we're looking for facts that support it. And that's part of the problem that led to a lot of issues of scientific integrity in government. Uh, our politicians, however, cater to the squeaky wheel. Uh, then House Majority Leader Tom DeLay, for instance, who himself has a degree in biology, argued that the Columbine shootings occurred in part, quote, because our school systems teach our children that they are nothing but glorified apes who have evolutionized out of some primordial mud. I wonder who he's pandering to. <clears throat> Both John McCain and Sarah Palin, unfortunately, are on record supporting the teaching of creationism in science class on the grounds that we should, quote, teach the controversy as if all theories had equal weight. And I, un I assume that most of you understand the difference between a scientific theory and a theory. Scientific theory is a theory like, for instance, the theory of gravity, but we don't often argue with that. Uh, this uh, poster reminds me to tell you about a, a science museum executive that I spoke to uh, who told me about how when uh, certain homeschoolers come to uh, visit the uh, dinosaur exhibits at that science museum, the uh, teachers tell the kids, now just remember those fossils and bones were put there by Satan to fool you. <clears throat> Unfortunately, our kids need to compete in a global biotech future. So while this is sometimes painfully funny, it is also frightening and angering. Uh, it, this is hurting our national ability to compete in a world and in a century that is going to be dominated particularly by biosciences. But the religion versus science debate is really, as I said earlier, a false dichotomy. This is a particularly beautiful juxtaposition, I think, uh, between the two. Uh, religion and science can and should coexist, and our polling shows they do. You remember that poll with 85% of Republicans. A similar poll showed that 70% of those Republicans consider themselves devoutly religious, and yet they wanted to see a science debate and had deep interest in science. Hmm, imagine that. Science is a tool for understanding the natural world, and anyone that knows about science knows that it does not make pronouncements about ultimate reality. There is not a conflict here. Ultimate reality is the field of faith and religion. Decisions in the Oval Office, however, in Congress should really be based on evidence and not just faith. Scientists, however, need to join the national dialogue to get this to happen. And that's the issue. The stakes really couldn't be higher. Our economy, we've been through this, and this is a point that we made to the campaigns. It's really shifted from innovation and making things to serving each other. Remember the service economy that we were all talking about about five years ago, to moving our increasingly complex pieces of paper around. And of course, that's all since imploded on us. As economies mature, they move overseas. We've seen this over and over and over. America is a leader in innovation, but then those economies mature and move overseas. Without investment in science and research, what is the next economy that is going to propel us forward? How are we going to continue to support our lifestyle without degrading our environment? What about planetary viability? Congress, meanwhile, was paralyzed at the time. This is from October of 2008. Uh, and we don't have to go into the details, but it just shows essentially that they had failed to fund most of our major national research budgets. And they were just continuing them forward on a continuing revo resolution, punting them uh, into 2009 over a relatively small disagreement with the president that really should have been overcome. Uh, we lost incredible resources at some of our national laboratories because of this. This is reason three that they gave us. The popularity contest, the high school popularity contest, and the fear of embarrassment. There's a political rule of thumb, if you're asking something, or if you ask something you should know about, don't, you might look foolish. Recent polls have shown a fifth of Americans can't locate the U.S. on a world map. Why do you think this is? I personally believe 
that U.S. Americans are unable to do so because uh, some uh, people out there in our nation don't have maps and uh, I believe that our ed education like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq everywhere like such as and I believe that they should uh, our education over here in the U.S. should help the U.S. Or, or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries so we will be able to build up our future for our children. Thank you very much. This incidentally is Miss South Carolina, the home state of Representative Joe Wilson, I'm told. Uh, Dean Kamen said, we get what we celebrate. And that's really true. He is, uh, of course, the famous inventor of the Segway and also the DARPA arm, which is a robotic uh, prosthetic arm that is being uh, developed for returning uh, Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans. Uh, he has started a program called FIRST that celebrates uh, engineering by getting kids and teams to design robots and compete uh, and rewards them with a huge uh, competition and event in the Atlanta Dome uh, once a year. It is, uh, this year I think they had something like uh, 200,000 kids participating in this. It's a huge initiative and it's really helping retrain kids thinking from celebrating sports heroes and movie stars to celebrating scientists and engineers. That's where we need to go. We decided that we needed to overcome this fear of embarrassment with the candidates by giving them an open book test. We weren't going to sandbag them with any questions about the 14th digit of pi. We were really interested in science policy. Remember how science affects our lives. But this is a toxic environment for politicians to talk about science. And we were facing this beer-slinging street cred thing and the two cultures and the religious rights political organization uh, and the absence of the news media in the equation, but particularly the absence of scientists. But we did have our signers and our poll results, and we needed to prove to them what we were after. We put together all these organizations to help us. All our signers had submitted 3,400 questions that they wanted to ask the pre candidates for president. We boiled those down to the top 14 science questions facing America, and I gave Harold Varmus a call, Nobel laureate, uh, and uh, who, who was an early supporter of science debate and it had gone on to uh, help uh, the Obama campaign, and Craig Barrett, the chair of Intel, who put me in touch with uh, some people at the McCain campaign, and I said, you've at least got to answer these in writing. Too much is at stake here. I didn't hear anything back. In late August, uh, my son and I uh, went for a backpacking trip in Rocky Mountain National Park. And here, here he is, and at the kind of the base of a foot of a glacier, we're probably about 500 feet below the Continental Divide. And I was thinking, you know, once we got up there, I've got one foot, in the east and one foot in the west. And it reminds me of all these artificial divides we've got in this country between red states and blue states and religion and science and the two cultures and Republicans and Democrats and none of them really matter. And yet here I am standing up here, one foot on either side and it's pretty damn lonely and windy and a heck of a climb to get up here. But it is a great view and I need to hold on to that. I figured nothing was gonna happen. But on the way down, when my cell phone started working again, I got a call from the Obama campaign. They answered the 14 top science questions, and a few weeks later, the McCain campaign was forced to respond as well. We posted all of those answers on our website, and we did a press release, and all those Netroots people, those tens of thousands of people, started buzzing. And before we knew it, we had made about 800 million media impressions not only in the United States, but around the world. And we finally started seeing discussion in the campaigns of all these science policy issues that are so critical to the future uh, and ongoing viability of this country and this planet. Science debate really focused President Obama on science. Uh, he formed a science advisory team to answer those 14 questions. This is the first time somebody had dogged these candidates about these types of issues before the, or during the campaign. Uh, he developed a science policy from the answers, and his major science appointments were early science debate supporters. You'll see at the top is Energy Secretary Stephen Chu, NOAA Director Jane Lubchenco, a marine biologist, and Presidential Science Advisor John Holdren. 
For the first time, a president had a science policy going in in a sense of how it informed the rest of his overall agenda, which is key. In his inauguration speech, President Obama featured science at the top, saying he would restore science to its rightful place, which was our mission statement. Thank you. Thank you. Of those 14 top science questions, uh, Chuck had mentioned that two of them had to do with the topic under discussion here this, you know, over the next couple of days or today and tomorrow. Uh, one of those, of course, was climate change and the other is water. Um, the wording of the question was 39 states expect some level of water shortage over the next decade and scientific studies suggest that a majority of our water resources are at risk. What policies would you support to meet demand for water resources? This is a question that we wound up asking after a lot of political wrangling between the various organizations who all had their own political bent, some tilting Republican, some tilting Democrat, and then also running it by an attorney who made sure that it wasn't partisan. The question that we started out with was, scientific studies show that severe worldwide water shortages <clears throat> affect at least 400 million people today and may affect 4 billion people by 2050. Clean water advocates say that in the U.S., 59% of the waterways supplying drinking water to 100 million people are at risk. Uh, that later figure uh, was, uh, is fairly well known. Uh, those facts are still true today, and they underscore the importance of this question in this conference. Unfortunately, this was the question that the candidates least addressed, as this popular science article talked about. Uh, it's complex, it's difficult to manage at the federal level, and this is something that we have not really seen happen because of that. Uh, water resources, aquifers, all kinds of water management issues are uh, generally ha happen at the state level and even at uh, county and local government levels. And there is no uh, concerted, uh, focused water policy happening really at a national level that's having any influence at all. And this is something in the age of climate change that we really have to get our mind around uh, because water does not know jurisdictional boundaries. And if someone draws down an aquifer in one place that directly affects a community downstream, that's a big problem. I expect that we're going to see that type of issue continue as well as water wars and water migration and, and similar issues that I'm sure you've heard about earlier today. The larger problem in America of science policy illiter illiteracy still remains at all levels, really. Um, the education system is part of the problem. It's inherently political in the United States. There's just, it's just the way it's structured. There's no way around it. You've got 15,000 independent school districts. Here's a picture of all of them. It's incredible. And each one of those school districts is independently governed with locally elected school board officials. So just imagine the number of school board officials around the country. All of them setting curriculum, particularly science curriculum, like whether we should teach alternative theories like creation in science class. And these are often local bankers, business persons, politicians, people of standing in the community, not so often scientists. This is an issue. In 2000, the National Science Teachers Association did a study and they found that 31% of middle school science teachers have been assigned to teach a subject in which they were not certified or had not achieved at least a college minor. 24% of high school science teachers have been assigned out of field in relation to their college studies. And of both groups, 20% were assigned out of field in relation to their state certification. So what do you do if you're teaching a subject that you really don't have any training in? Well, one thing you can do is you can turn to videos, right, to do your education for you. Here's a brochure from Teachers Video Company that markets to teachers in this position. And you'll see, for instance, in the center page, we've got all kinds of, of important science videos like the Bermuda Triangle, Bermuda Triangle 2, Nostradamus, Secrets of the Psychics, uh, Atlantis, uh, the Loch Ness Monster. This stuff is being marketed as science. There, there is also, as an adjunct to this, the rise of a political class that has found it convenient to be prideful in their ignorance and disdain of science. This attitude that scientists are somehow intellectual and 
disconnected and they look down their nose at you, they're the elite, they're superior, which scientists really have not been in the game to refute, unfortunately. We saw, for instance, Unfortunately, again, since he was a, in many ways a strong advocate for research and science, John McCain talking uh, on the campaign about earmarks and he was singling out a $3 million for an overhead projector in Chicago, Illinois. Well, that happened to be a planetarium projector at the Adler Planetarium, <clears throat> the oldest planetarium west of the Mississippi, which had not replaced their projector in over 40 years. Our knowledge of the skies have changed significantly in the last 40 years, and they issued a statement saying, well, we felt that science literacy was important enough to ask Congress for this funding. He also talked about $3 million to study the DNA of bears. He talked about, I don't know if it was a criminal case or a paternity case, but $3 million for studying the DNA of bears. And it was a good joke. Uh, but this was mandated, the study was being done by the U.S. Geological Survey, and it was being mandated by the Endangered Species Act, which was requiring them to count the number of grizzly bears. The only way you can really do that, since they're hard to track in the wild, is by putting up barbed wire scratching posts on trees where they rub their back, you collect their hair, and then you do a DNA analysis. Worked out pretty slick. And then there was this example, which is probably not going to play either. Where does a lot of that earmark oh, money end up, money? anyway? You guys well, have heard some the of the examples anyway. of where those dollars go. You've heard about the bridges, and you've heard about um, these, some of these pet projects that really don't make a whole lot of sense. And sometimes these dollars, they go to projects having little or nothing to do with the public good. Things like fruit fly research in Paris, France. I kid you. I kid you not. Fruit fly research in Paris, France. It sounds pretty ridiculous on the face of it, right? Well, let's look at that lowly fruit fly there that <clears throat> was being so picked upon. In 1933, Thomas Hunt Morgan won a Nobel Prize using the fruit fly for showing that genes are passed on by way of chromosomes. In 1995, Edward Lewis, Christine Nusslein Volhard, and Eric Weishaus won a Nobel Prize using the fruit fly for discovering that methods by which a fruit fly egg, <clears throat> which is a single cell, patterns itself into bodily segments which has helped us understand, essentially, uh, problems in genetic uh, replication and birth defects. Governor Palin herself was in Pittsburgh at the time when she said that. She was speaking about her signature issue of disability and, uh, and uh, special needs. Uh, there's a fruit fly-based center for research into autism at the University of North Carolina. The earmark that she was picking on was obtained by Representative Mike Thompson, a California Democrat, which was to support research into the olive fruit fly, which has been decimating uh, olive trees in Europe and has spread to the United States. <clears throat> oh yeah, I kid you not. The president needs to set the tone to turn this around. I was talking to uh, the chair of Research America and he says we need to figure out how to push the president to do a major national address talking about science and engineering and focusing the country around this for the future of America. Not just in uh, a State of the Union address, the casual mention that that's just the way it's typically handled, but a full-on Apollo program level address. But there is a greater cultural problem, and we've been talking about the education system plays a part. The structure of American news and science reporting plays a part and the silence by scientists plays a major part. There are solutions, though. The President and Congress <clears throat> need to have continued pressure and support from us. They're politicians. They need support from their constituents in order to hold policy positions. I once asked a member of Congress, what constitutes a groundswell of support in your office on an issue? And I'm not talking about canned things where a special interest group sends in, you know, 100 emails from somebody, but just individual people either calling or writing you on their own. And that person said, a dozen contacts. That's a groundswell. So it doesn't take much. Scientists need to speak out and become more active in the national dialogue. This is critical to their role as citizens in the nation. 
Science debate is seeking funds to continue as a useful way of focusing attention at all levels, uh, but much, much more work is needed and much, much more support. I volunteered full time. As I said, we didn't get money from any of our, our co-sponsors. This was all funded from individual donations. We raised about 50,000, which covered our expenses, but not really much more. You can call your elected officials, if you're a scientist, that is, and offers, offer to serve on their science advisory committee, and if they don't have one, offer to form one for them. Give money to candidates who support sensible science and engineering policy positions. Contact the White House and lobby the President to give a major Apollo-level speech refocusing and retooling the nation around science and engineering. The time really couldn't be sooner for this. Write and push the media to break the science policy barrier. Our nation was founded by scientists, statesmen like Jefferson and Franklin, and it requires the involvement of scientists, statesmen, and those who care about science in the plurality of our national dialogue for America to continue to move forward. There is only one, and the ongoing viability of the planet is perhaps the, no, I won't even say perhaps, there really is no greater moral imperative, is there? For religion, for science, for government, for politics, for citizens. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I'll take questions. Thank you.